My name is Ernst Ludwig van Tadden, often abbreviated into ELU van Tadden. I'm professor of economics and finance at Mannheim University. I'm a fellow of ECGI, the uh, co-organizer of this event together with Jesse. And um, I'm most grateful to be able to share this most interesting session. Uh, it's always difficult to speak after Bengt Holmström, and as I now learn, it's even more difficult to speak after Bengt Holmström and Paul Polman. But I'm pretty sure we are able to hold up pretty well. And the session we are now starting is on corporate purpose, like uh, the whole conference, but it's uh, on corporate purpose, if you want to, made real. It's on corporate purpose, ownership and performance. And so we'll talk about a few of the issues that Bengt and Paul have addressed in a potentially more abstract way. And we will see what um, at least some of academia can contribute to that question. Um, I may start by quoting Carol Lano, who is a distinguished uh, leader of a European think tank in the comments to the last session when I just looked through them, Carl said, most academics are still behind and they cannot adapt to the, adapt to the new challenges in their paradigms. And uh, he concludes with markets are radically wrong. Um, I think this session at least will show how much academics may be able to adapt to new paradigms, or maybe as uh, Ben Holmstrom might have put it, that uh, markets are in fact quite good at recognizing constraints and doing the best they can do with it. So let's see what our two distinguished speakers have to say on this. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Claudia Gartenberg, who will present her paper for today's session. Claudine is professor of uh, management at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, is uh, one of the leading experts in uh, the world on corporate purpose and what it may mean for concrete issues such as um, employee, employee satisfaction, or corporate uh, behavior or um, corporate and financial performance. We will have uh, a 25 minutes uh, talk by Claudine being followed by a discussion by Caroline Flummer. Caroline Flummer is professor of uh, strategy and innovation at the Questrom School of Business of Boston University. And uh, Caroline as well has established herself in the last 10 years as one of the leading experts on things such as, and I'm deliberately vague here, corporate social responsibility and uh, is uniquely placed to discuss Claudine's views, which I in fact have not yet been able to study myself. So I'm very much looking forward to what Claudine has to say, and then to what Caroline is going to make of that. We will in the end have 20 minutes of a discussion and I encourage you all who are listening now um, to submit questions via the chat function and via, via the instruments um, that you have been communicated in the conference. Uh, in the conference invitation. I will get them on my screen and I will try to structure them a little bit. I can already apologize in advance that I will not do justice to everybody. I have uh, no experience in chairing uh, conferences with more than 400 participants. So I hope to do my best and uh, please be active and uh, propose uh, feedback. And I will try to put that to our to presenters. But uh, without much ado, let me turn this over to Claudine. Thank you for being here, Claudine, or maybe 
sorry, you can't be here. However, you want to take that perspective. Looking forward to what you're having to say. A few minutes before the end of your allotted time, I will uh, give you a little sign that uh, you know what's coming up. Thank you, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Fantastic, Elu. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you for the co to the conference organizers for this fantastic conference. So, just as by way of introduction, uh, so my again, my name is Claudine Gardenberg. I teach here at the Wharton School, and I study. Uh, you you can think of this as empirical research and evidence on, on corporate purpose. That's that's where this talk is going to fit in uh, to to this session. Uh, and uh, providing some of the evidence uh, that we know so far uh, on this. And this is evidence, I'm gonna summarize about a 10 year, a little bit less than a 10 year research program that's ongoing on empirical corporate purpose. And I would be remiss not to mention my collaborators in this effort. Uh, so this is work uh, that has been done with George Serafim, who's at Harvard Business School, and uh, Andrea Pratt, who's at Columbia, and one of my graduate students, uh, Shen Yu, who's here at, at Wharton. Okay. Uh, so uh, the beautiful thing about being at this point in the conference is I don't need to give a lot of background on purpose, uh, but I'll give a little bit uh, to get us started. <clears throat> so as we know, and as evidence from the interest in this conference, uh, interest in this idea of corporate purpose has gone up substantially over the last few decades. This has a little bit of truncation effects at the end of this graph, but uh, there's been about a two to three X uh, interest in uh, increase in the public discourse on corporate purpose since that Bartlett and Gauchal, uh, uh, uh paper came out in the mid 1990s. When you survey millennials uh, on what they're looking for in terms of uh, what keeps them in the workplace, a sense of purpose, which you can see here on the left hand side of the graph, consistently uh, uh, remains at the top of what what people are looking for in the workplace. And the term millennials, I think, is misused here in the sense that other research has found that actually the, the need for uh, an interest in finding a sense of meaning in your vocation actually goes up with age uh, and not down over time. So this, this, this looking for a sense of purpose is actually quite a universal uh, uh, aspect of the workforce, particularly as financial constraints are lifted. It tends to go down where it's, it's counter cyclical in that sense. Uh, there's only one problem with, with, with how to study this empirically, which is that managers know this. Managers know that people are looking for a sense of purpose. And so uh, you, you see, as, as, as Colin mentioned yesterday, you see a lot of twaddle that's out there. And I know this. I worked in consulting for 10 years before I entered business school. And about half of that time was spent in Silicon Valley. Uh, and, you know, the amount of, of nonsense purpose statements that you get working in the Valley is overwhelming. Uh, and so, you know, here's one that's recent, and I, I'm proud that I actually called out this company to my MBA students long before they actually imploded, but this is just a notoriously, uh, uh, you know, scam of a business. Uh, we work in Adam Newman, and if you re read their filings to go public and what their purpose is, it's, it's actually what my former colleague at NYU used to call yoga babble. Uh, it just is nonsense. It means nothing. Uh, so, you know, we are a community company committed to maximum global impact. Our mission is to elevate the world's, yeah, I don't, nobody knows what this stuff means. And yet every company has some form of a purpose statement out there. And so the question is empirically as academics, uh, you know, how do we actually study this stuff if there's so much cheap talk that's out there? Uh, and if companies just say whatever they need to say to sort of try to drape themselves in this sort of banner of purpose. So, uh, so first let's actually define what we mean by purpose. And uh, so there were some definitions at the beginning of the session today. Here's, here's the way we think about it as part of this research program. And so these, all, these are sort of variants on the same theme. Uh, so one of them is, is a statement by Rebecca Henderson who's speaking tomorrow and, and colleague Eric Vandenstein at HBS, a concrete goal that reaches beyond profit maximization. You can also take, you know, much more general general view. You know, what is the company's reason for being? That's actually the definition of purpose. Uh, a period at the, you know, according to the dictionary. Uh, and we, the way we've distilled it in our research is a set of beliefs about the meaning of a firm's work beyond quantitative measures of financial performance. And you can see here we've actually deliberately stayed away from this term pro-social. Primarily because you know we're, we're we're agnostic around what pro-social is, right? Pro-social means different things to different people, 
Uh, and so from our perspective, the meaning of a firm's work is sufficiently broad to capture purpose for our, for our intents. And so what does purpose do? And so, so, so we have a very specific view on corporate purpose and what it, what it does for firms. And the way we think about it is that it, it, it enables a shared sense of meaning to, uh, around the people that are involved in this endeavor. And the word shared and the word meaning are both important. So when you look at the word meaning, so this is a picture of Viktor Frankl, a mid-century social scientist, uh, he was a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote about his experiences afterwards. And one of his big conclusions is he said, look, we are, we are meaning motivated beings. We are not motivated by money. We're not motivated by material uh, uh, objects. We are motivated by fundamental need for meaning in our lives. That meaning may come from family. It might come from religion. It might come from our vocations and our work. But meaning is the motive force of who we are as individuals. And taking that insight and expanding it to companies uh, uh, in the shared sense, for us, this notion of purpose is how do we share the sense of being? What is the endeavor that we're doing? And that, that is how we understand it. And this is actually even percolated in some sense into economics as, as early as Keynes who said, um, if human nature felt no satisfaction, profit apart, so that parentheses is very important, in constructing a factory, a railway, a mine or a farm, there might not be so much investment nearly as a function of cold calculation in the sense that we have to feel some meaning in terms of what we are doing to truly be motivated in our endeavors. So social psychologists and marketing academics actually know this at the individual level. So there's been just a, a multitude of lab studies on, on the importance of meaning. Um, some of them by my colleague, Adam Grant, uh, here at Wharton. Uh, so let me just give you a couple of these examples. So on the upper left, you see this Lego man. And this is one of my favorite examples on the importance of meaning. Uh, so this is a bionicle Lego, uh, which, you know, I don't really know what that is. But what they did in this lab study is they divided the, the lab participants into two groups. They paid them exactly the same piece rate right, the exact same money. If you build a bionicle Lego man, you get X amount of cents, and the most that you can build in a half hour period or however long it was, you'll get paid that amount. So the financial rewards were identical between the two groups. The only difference between the two groups is on one side of the group, they took those bionicle Lego men and they lined them up. So very simple uh, uh, act, act where they just say, you're creating these Lego men. And on the other side of the group, as soon as you handed them a Lego man, they destroyed it and threw the Legos back into the box. So rendered the action completely meaningless. And even in that very, very simple difference between those two groups, the group that could see the fruits of the work lined up was 50% more productive for exactly the same financial rewards. So endowing work with even a, a tiny little modicum of meeting makes people more endowed, uh, sorry, more uh, uh, engage in more effort. And so that's also true in the upper left. This is a famous study by Adam Grant in 2007, where these are fundraisers for universities, just five minutes with the students that benefit from the fundraising, raised the uh, amount of time they spent on the call by almost double, quadrupled the amount of money that they were able to raise. Same in the lower right with radiologists. If you get to see who your patients are, your write-ups increase in length, your diagnoses increase in accuracy, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a multitude of, 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 of studies that show that meaning matters for individuals, but what do we, you know, how do we extrapolate that up to a company level? So that's, that's been the, the objective of our research program on empirical corporate purpose. And there's a lot of related ideal ideas at this, at this firm slash economy level. So there's beautiful research done by uh, Caroline, who's on this call as well as discussed yesterday by Patrick Bolton, my co-author George Seraphim on, e on uh, ESG measures. There's research on stakeholder orientations within firms, how that changes how, they, how firms act and behave and compete. And then at the more what we call micro and management, the more individual level research on employee satisfaction, culture, trust, leadership, meaning, uh, again, by some of my colleagues at Wharton. But on purpose itself, we have a lot of theoretical discussions and case studies but we actually have very little empirical progress. And so there's one likely reason for why that is, uh, which is that there's some real uh, empirical hurdles in studying purpose. And there's, there's three of them that I wanna highlight here. One of them is that purpose is a very intangible idea. 
Uh, the second is measurements. As we heard in the last session, we're kind of in a data desert when it comes to credible purpose, right? If, particularly if you can't trust what companies say. And then the third is what we like to call in academia identification. Uh, so how do you disentangle purpose from all the other aspects of the company, who the CEO is, what the nature of governance is? You know, nobody's going to randomly assign purpose across companies. And so how do you actually figure out this role of purpose? And so these are very large, uh, meaty, uh, thorny empirical issues. Where we're trying to make progress here is on the measurement side, uh, coming up with a way of measuring corporate purpose that is not perfect, uh, but at least it has some benefits over what's been done. We adopt other definitions. And then on the correlation versus causality, we do our best. It's not perfect, but we're aware of it. And we use what, what we call a preponderance of evidence approach to try to disentangle these two. So we have one paper that's already published, but I'll give you the highlights of this paper. This relates purpose to financial performance. And so let me give you the highlights of this paper and then I'll talk about our recent paper and give you a sense of what's to come on deck. So in this paper, we ask, what do we know about the link of purpose and performance? So now I'll tell you how we're purporting to get around our measurement issue of how we think about purpose. And the way we do it is by espoused employee beliefs in the meaning uh, of their work. So we have data from about half a million employees for this first study across 500 companies. So this has by far been one of the largest studies ever that's looked at, at, at meaning in the workplace. And what we say is we say a measure of purpose is roughly a measure of the meaning that employees find in their job. And so these are the survey items that we aggregate to measure purpose. And what we say is that companies that have been a, a successful in implementing purpose credibly in the workforce are those whose companies have on average a strong sense of meaning and impact in their work. And so this is our solution to the cheap talk, talk challenge of these purpose statements, which we're interested in employees on and of themselves, but we're also interested in them because they're the ones that judge how credible purpose is at the firm level. So companies where on average employees have a high sense of meaning in their work, we're saying those are companies that have credibly instilled purpose. So that's how we get around this, this measurement challenge, at least given that we're in a data desert now for purpose. So what do we find? The first thing we find is that purpose falls down the ranks. So on the right-hand side of this bar graph is the highest ranks in organizations. The left-hand side is the lowest hourly ranks in organizations. And what you can see here is that it, it progressively weakens the sense of purpose the lower down in organizations that you go. Now, the second thing we find is that purpose organizations actually come in two separate flavors. So these purpose measures co-vary with two other uh, 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 beliefs, sets of beliefs among employees. One is that you find companies that have what we call high purpose camaraderie. So I feel, find meaning in my work and I also feel like a special sense of family in this organization. So that's one type of companies. The other type of companies is what we call purpose clarity. These are the questions that have the word clear in them. Uh, this is the, came from the data. We did not impose this on the data. So I find a high sense of meaning in our work. And I believe that management has a clear view. I have a clear view of what I need to do to be successful. What we find is that purpose alone has no relation to performance. There's zero correlation of anything that's negative uh, uh, as it relates to performance. Purpose camaraderie also has zero correlation to performance. But purpose clarity is highly predictive of performance in a way that after all of the tests that we go through in our study uh, appears to be causal. And so here's the summary of those results. The x-axis here is, is purpose, low purpose on the left, high purpose on the right. The y-axis here is performance. This is one measure of performance we use in this study. And what you can see here is purpose camaraderie does not predict performance, but purpose clarity does. Here's a sense of the magnitude going from the bottom to the top de decile in terms of performance. Uh, co uh, it corresponds to about a 4% increase on return on assets, which is enormous, um, about a 0.7% uh, 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 annual return on your enterprise value. And the top quintile performance uh, uh, is associated with about a 7% alpha uh, uh, annual stock return. And that's, that's enormous, but it's about the same order of magnitude as, as well-governed firms. 
Um, so uh, firms that are on the high end of corporate governance have about these sites of uh, this, this type of returns. Other studies that have looked at R&D intensity also find these types of returns. So you can think about it as about uh, up with those types of high quality companies. Now, the other aspect of the study that we find is that that connection between purpose and performance is driven entirely by the middle ranks of the company. So if the executives feel it, it's actually in some ways weekly negative. Hourly employees, there's no correlation with performance. But when your middle ranks of your employees feel a high sense of purpose clarity, those are the companies that outperform. So these are the core findings of our paper. There's no connection between proclaimed purpose and performance, but there is a connection between purpose and performance if it's believed and credible, credibly held by the employees of the organization, if it's accompanied by clarity, and if it's felt by the middle ranks. So now our second paper says, okay, that's great. You know, we've sort of established, uh, if, if you believe us, this, this relationship between purpose and performance. Now, what drives differences in purpose across uh, companies, all right? We see a wide vari variation in purpose across companies. And we start uh, with looking at corporate ownership. Why do we look at corporate owners? As Bank uh, uh, talked about in the prior uh, session, you know, these are the ultimate principles of the firm. Uh, these are the arbiters uh, of, of the major corporate decisions. And so uh, do we see a correlation, any type of meaningful difference between the type of ownership of firms and the level of purpose held by employees? So that is this paper. So here we have a dramatically expanded sample. We have a million and a half employees across uh, over a thousand companies and a longer time period. And we look at the difference in just first these high level categories of the difference between publicly uh, traded firms and private firms and private equity firms. And the, what you can see here from this first graph is that that white line there is our baseline, which is private firms that are not owned by private equity firms. So these are just your vanilla private firms. Compared to them, purpose is lower in public firms and in private equity owned firms. That is driven by employees down the ranks of organizations. So what you can see here on this right-hand graph is on the left-hand side is executives, and then it goes down to sales, managers, the salaried rank, and on the right-hand side is your hourly ranks. And what we find is that purpose falls down the organization in, in public firms, but not in private firms. So the difference between public and private firms is driven by your lower ranked employees. Now we look at within publicly traded firms, uh, <clears throat> what drives, what is driving this in, ter in terms of what is the nature of your shareholders and your shareholder composition that relates to this lower purpose? And specifically, we look at commitment. And so we talked about in the prior session, this sort of this uh, short termism uh, that was that was talked about by both Paul and Bank. I think that was one of the areas that they agreed in. Um, and that's, you know, what we find is evidence fairly consistent with, with that discussion. So on this left-hand side here, the x-axis here is the proportion of your firm that's controlled by hedge funds. Uh, and the right-hand side is uh, corporate purpose. And what you can see is the higher proportion of your firm that is controlled by hedge funds, the lower the purpose is. And that is, again, driven by down, down inside the organization, not at the higher ranks. And then on the right-hand side of the graph, we create a measure of investor commitment. So again, the average a holding period of institutional investors these days in the US is nine months. Uh, and so what we do is we look at the composition of who the firm's shareholders are, and we look at the net of your dedicated investors minus your transient investors. And we say that that net difference is the degree to which your owners are committed to your firm. And what you can see here is that on the x-axis, commitment goes up as you go from left to right, and purpose goes up as well. So there's a correlation between uh, uh, what proportion of your shares are controlled by long-term investors and corporate purpose, again, inside the organization. <clears throat> oh, looks like I'm frozen. I am definitely frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay, hold on. Let's go back. Okay. Um, then, then there's a couple findings that made it to the chopping block of our current paper, just for conciseness, but given the breadth of this audience, I wanted to call out. Uh, and so that is, um, what are the managerial choices that are different inside these types of firms? And what we find is that companies that are controlled by less committed investors 
they make different corporate structure choices. They choose more outsider CEOs, CEOs with more finance backgrounds. Uh, they do more corporate restructuring uh, uh, decisions, particularly more M&A, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and they pick different compensation structures. And what you can see here is this interesting graph here between the CEO employee pay gap, and this is normalized. So this is by the most popular salaried employees. So there's no mix of employee issues with this graph. So the higher the, the CEO to salaried pay gap, uh, the lower the corporate purpose is. So this sort of corresponds to a lot of the discussion in the past session. So this paper, the core findings is that purpose is lower in publicly traded firms, in firms with activists, less committed shareholders, and it's driven by lower ranked employees. So you can think of these are the firms which have this sort of high purpose inequality inside the organizations. Uh, now the big question is treatment or sorting. So my husband works for a hedge fund and he would tell you that they don't pick their firms randomly. Uh, and I would agree with that. And so the question is, are we just seeing investors sort to different types of companies? Uh, you'll have to read the paper to see all the tricks that we go through to try to tease these apart. And the short version of this is there appears to be both that's going on. It appears to be both a treatment effect and a sorting effect at the same time, which kind of intuitively makes sense. Um, and we can account for about half the gap between publicly, public and private firms by the nature of the decisions that, um, that companies make, uh, the CEOs that they choose, and the corporate structure choices that they choose. Um, so I'm just linking these, these, this research program to the conference. So the conference asks, could purpose deliver better corporate governance? I, you know, so far, you know, sort of true to our study, I think we're actually the flip. I think we have more to say on can corporate governance deliver better purpose uh, at this stage in our research program. And you know, here's a summary of both sets of our findings, right? Which is uh, purpose is, does seem to be complementary to performance in the sense that they don't seem to be substitutes. The higher purpose, at least as believed by your employees, is correlated with better long-term performance and it appears to be a treatment effect uh, causal. Uh, and purpose is also related to the nature of the, of the ownership within the firm. So uh, firms that have more committed owners uh, uh, appear to have higher purpose, uh, and those firms actually make different choices. So then just a couple thoughts to tie us up here. There does seem to be this interesting paradox between profits and investor actions, in the sense that if you would assume that investors are profit motivated, why does it appear that they're doing, you know, that they're engaging in actions that seem to, you know, be related to worse corporate purpose or worse sense of purpose among their employees? And so we think about this in the paper, and I think that's a very sort of interesting and important question more generally beyond our study. Uh, and the answer that we come to is, you know, we can't prove this definitively, uh, but it comes a little bit to what uh, uh, Bengt Holmstrom won his Nobel Prize for, uh, which is which is we speculate on this role of observability, which is that these outsider active investors come in, they have an average holding period of let's say nine months uh, you know, or so, and they engage in highly visible actions, right? They kick out the CEO, they force some restructuring actions to, to, to happen, they change the compensation structure, and all of that might be very visible to outside uh, uh, people. What's less measurable is the data that we have. Right, which is the sense of purpose in the in the middle ranks of the employees. Right, we have a proprietary survey uh, uh, that measures this, but you know these investors don't, and so there could be this interesting challenge of observability and its effect on purpose. <clears throat> now, the last piece of this uh, talk is that you know one of the you know you know to the to the to the conference topic can purpose deliver better corporate governance. You know, there does, this, there does appear to be a substantial role for institutional investors. Uh, the durations is related to the sense of purpose among employees. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as we mentioned last time, there's, you know, block holding has gone up. So the, the shareholder concentrations have gone up. Uh, there's, there's been a rise in private equity. Uh, there's increasingly arrived in these, uh, these SPACs, these special purpose acquisition companies that are actually taking companies back public again, but who those shareholders are and what their priorities are is probably uh, different from these dedicated shareholders. And so I do think that there is a role for uh, in thinking about this relationship between uh, institutional investors and, uh, and the degree of credible uh, not yoga babble, but credibly implemented purpose that firms follow. 
So that is the short version of where we are, where we have two more studies that are on deck uh, and, and more to come. So thank you so much. And Caroline, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen if I can actually figure out how to do that uh, and hand it over to you. So, ah, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Kenny. Fascinating stuff. We hope to be able to talk more about it uh, after Caroline, but uh, let me now turn it over to Caroline Flammer. Thanks for, uh, for sharing your thoughts and here you go, please. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elu. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for organizing this fantastic conference. And thank you, Claudine, for two fascinating studies that I was allowed to read. Um, so I already knew that Claudine would do a ph phenomenal job in summarizing her studies. So let me skip that traditional part of summarizing her studies and rather jump right into the discussion. So let me start by saying there's a lot to like about these two studies. Um, these are very interesting studies. This is multidisciplinary work that bridges academic silos that is so important to really, you know, uh, get a better understanding of this complex world. They offer a richness of insights about employees per perception of the meaningfulness of their work. And perhaps most importantly, they offer important implications for practice. So I know there are lots of managers, board of directors, investors on this webinar, watching this webinar. I encourage you to pay attention to these intangible factors. Now, um, it's actually funny that um, Claudine mentioned the challenges that come together with studying purpose because I will focus <laughs> my discussion on some of these aspects, okay? So I'm gonna focus on four comments. The first one is what I call the two elephants in the room and the bigger picture. Then the underlying channels, investor influence, and then I'm gonna say a few words with respect to the empirics and identification. Now, let me start with what I call the two elephants in the room and the big picture. And I will discuss each one of these elephants separately, and then I'm gonna put them together into the broader picture. All right, so let me start with the first one. So the first elephant is about meaning. Okay, so it, I mean, it has been clear, and it's also, Claudine also says, it's really, really hard to, to capture purpose. So what does corporate purpose really mean? Now, to the credit of the authors, they're actually very clear in how they define purpose. It's a concrete goal or objective for the firm that reaches beyond profit maximization. And they further highlight that this definition need not be explicitly pro-social in orientation. So strictly speaking, this definition hypothetically includes weapon manufacturers that aim to produce the most effective deadly weapon and cigarette companies that aim to produce the best smoking experience possible, such as the most ad addictive cigarette. Okay. Now, I doubt it that this is what the, the authors really mean under corporate purpose. And I doubt it that this is what the audience means when they hear corporate purpose. What I believe the authors aim to say is that corporate purpose very much relates to a company's mission and its contribution to society and the natural environment that goes beyond profit maximization. And this is often called corporate social responsibility. And so this raises the question of how does corporate purpose really differ from other known concepts such, such as a firm's mission or corporate social responsibility? Um, and so for example, and I know tomorrow there will be a, a very exciting panel of board of directors talking about corporate purpose. So how should, for example, board of directors think about a firm's purpose? Is it a substitute or is it rather a complement to the firm's mission and its CSR? So this is my first suggestion. I recommend to be more precise and explicit what exactly corporate purpose means and doesn't mean and how it differs from other known concepts such as a company's mission and its corporate social responsibility, or it's often also called ESG in the finance world. Now, let me get to the second elephant. And this is about the measure. Okay, so what do the authors actually measure? And I think Claudine was very clear. So they used the survey conducted by the Great Places to Work Institute, which has been used in previous literature to examine corporate culture and employee satisfaction. Now, um, to measure corporate purpose, in the 2019 study, Claudine, together with her 
co-authors Andrea Pratt and George Seberfeim, they focus on four specific questions. My work has special meaning. This is not just a job. I feel good about the ways we contribute to the community. When I look at what we accomplish, I feel a sense of pride and I'm proud to tell others I, wor where, um, I worked here. So if we think about it, these two four, four questions really relate to, and I think Claudine was very clear in her talk, it relates to employees' perception about the meaningfulness of the work, regardless of what the purpose or what the mission of the company actually is. Okay? Now, in the 2020 study, they use a slightly different measure and they expand the four questions with two additional questions that relate to management clarity. So this is my second suggestion. I would recommend to better align your theoretical constructs with what you actually measure, which is in this case is about employees' work meaningfulness and management clarity. And secondly, to be consistent in how you measure the constructs across studies. So I think this not only increases the consistency, but also the long-term impact of the studies. Again, it's really hard to capture corporate purpose and so given that it's so hard, maybe it's just better to just be very clear what you actually measure and use this as your theoretical construct. All right, now let me put these two elephants into the bigger picture, okay? So on one hand, we have at the firm level, we have corporate purpose and mission. At the individual level, we have employee work meaningfulness and employee satisfaction. And then in the middle, the bachelor level, we have corporate culture. Now, what is actually striking across these studies is that they tell a very coherent story. Corporate culture and employee work meaningfulness and satisfaction matters for financial performance. So this is not only an interesting finding, but most importantly, it also has important implications for managers and investors. Namely, corporate culture and employee work meaningfulness and satisfaction are valuable, and so therefore you should better pay attention to it. And secondly, that these intangible factors may in fact be a new addition to the broader bundle of governance mechanisms that are available to, to companies to increase their firm value. And so I think, so to me, and I know this goes way beyond the scope of this project, and I think this is rather food for thought for future research, uh, maybe the number, of, you know, number six of the papers that, that you're looking at, is to understand could it be that these intangible factors, corporate culture and employee work meaningfulness and satisfaction might be cheaper, but perhaps more valuable mechanisms compared to the other governance mechanisms that are available? All right, so my third suggestion is, I think there's a lot of unexplored potential and I recommend to discuss the bigger picture from the insights from this collective body of work and speak to the importance for practice. Now, let me get to the second comment, and this is with respect to the underlying mechanism. And this refers to the 2020 study, the follow-up study of Claudine and George. So in this study, they examined the relationship between corporate ownership and employee work meaningfulness and management clarity. So as Claudine mentioned, so for corporate ownership, they look at different dimensions, pub public versus private, and then within public and within private companies. And then they look at employees' perception of their work meaningfulness and management clarity, looking at these six questions that I mentioned before. Now, the two key findings I would like to highlight is that employee work meaningfulness and management clarity is stronger for private as opposed to public firms. And what I find a particularly intriguing result is that this difference is more pronounced for lower level employees. Now, this raises two questions. And the first one is, what is the underlying mechanism? Okay, so I think it would be really helpful to understand how does the ownership structure influence employees' perception of their work meaningfulness? And the second one is, um, why are our lower level employees, such as technicians or janitors, more responsive? So I think it would be very valuable to understand to which extent are they aware of a firm's ownership structure and the firm's higher level policies? So my fourth suggestion is I recommend to conceptually and empirically explore the underlying mechanisms and to gain some more perspective. The authors may want to um, conduct some interviews with employees at different levels and some anecdotal evidence. And I think this auxiliary analysis that Claudine mentioned at the very end of the presentation is getting closer to that, correct? So I, I recommend to dig deeper and really try to understand what is really the mechanism. 
And this leads me to the third comment, which is related, and this is about investors' influence. So we know that investors aim to influence the portfolio companies in different ways, more passively through ESG screening or ESG integration, and more actively through shareholder engagement and uh, proxy voting. Now, the existing work suggests that voice might actually be more effective in triggering changes in corporate behavior than exit. So in light of this literature, I think it would be interesting to understand how exactly do investors aim to influence their portfolio companies, which eventually leads to a change in employees' uh, 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 perception of the meaningfulness of the work. Okay, So this is my fifth suggestion. And I think actually by embedding their study in this broader literature and speaking to this literature, they can um, broaden the impact of the study uh, tremendously. Now, last but not least, let me say a very few words to the empirics and identification. So Ireland, I you me, don't have much time less if, uh, left if I may one, intervene, but one, please one go minute. on a little bit. It's, it's just one minute. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, energetic concerns, so Claudine already mentioned this is very tricky, and this is clearly very tricky, um, comparing, for example, public versus private firms. Okay? Now, to overcome this uh, challenge, the authors use a matching. Matching often helps. Now, in this case, it's quite tricky, actually, as most private firms are much smaller than public firms. So, for example, it could be that what we end up doing is matching unusually large private firms, firms that are so good they can afford to remain private despite their large size. So, in short, and I keep this very short, but ideally what the authors would do is use a quasi-natural experiment, and the experiment they could use is they could look at firms that successfully IPO'd and compare them with firms that filed for IPO but had to withdraw for quasi-exogenous reasons and as a result remained private. A similar design was used by Shai Bernstein in his JF 2015 studies. I recommend um, have a look and I hope this is helpful. So this is my last suggestion before I conclude. So I recommend to address and discuss potential limitations of the matching used, and ideally to supplement the analysis with quasi-experimental evidence using this exogenous withdrawal from IPO filings that I just described. So last but not least, let me conclude. Overall, I think these are really very interesting studies. This is multidisciplinary work that bridges academic silos. They offer a richness of insights about employees' perception of their meaningfulness of the work, and they offer very important implications for practice. So for all managers, directors, uh, board of directors, and investors watching this webinar, I recommend you pay attention to these intangible factors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caroline. It was uh, most interesting. And uh, we do have a few questions that I have already seen on my screen. Uh, I think it may be good because we don't have much time and it's, it's great to have the two of you here in this virtual room. You should talk a little bit more. I, we want to learn a little bit more from you. Claudine, would you want to respond to Carolyn a little bit? I think you should, you should take your time. There were a couple of interesting suggestions and uh, in particular, I like this question of what is the mechanism underlying the link between purpose and ownership, um, which was sort of getting to the heart of the matter uh, also in terms of the experience I have had as a, uh, the president of Mannheim University, where it's really, I think that's where you want to see how the machine driving these institutions works. And you may have a lot to say about this, but also please address whatever you um, want to uh, in terms of Caroline's uh, uh, ideas. And I will then just collect some questions from the floor and put them to, to the two of you. Uh, Claudine, will you, will you give it a try? Please. Yes, and I'll try to be very fast because I, I would love to hear comments from, from the audience. So even if you don't have questions, if you just have comments about your own experiences, uh, please, please, please share those as well. So I'll be 30 seconds so that we can maximize the input from uh, from the audience, uh, but just you know, in terms of um, in terms of mechanisms, I think that's a really really important point. And, and you know, right now what we have is in a longer version of paper two, we have some case studies that we've gone into, um, and and you know, the 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 punchline of those case studies in terms of what we think is happening is that 
these owners. Um, so I'm going to put the matching aside, right? That they, you know, you know, companies choose different types of companies. I'm going to focus mostly on the treatment side. Um, that these that these owners actually have different preferences for how companies are run. And so, you know, we go into um, uh, we talked a little bit about Toys R Us, for instance. That was uh, that was bought by uh, I think it was Bain Capital. Uh, and and part of it was the you know the the metrics so so they so you know and aside from the leverage that they put on the company um, the way that they managed it down to the store level in terms of the shifts in terms of the metrics in terms of the work structure in terms of the messages that they gave to the companies was entirely different after the company was bought out uh, by the firm and so we go into that in, uh, as uh, when we talk about it uh, there's another company I'm not going to use the name. Um, but it's a it's a company that's involved in the performing arts that I guarantee 90% of the people on this webinar has heard of, um, if not our customers of, um, that was really bought as a vanity project by a very prominent hedge fund owner. Um, and as soon as the company was bought, it was, it moved from being, we are involved in the fine arts to we're an awesome real estate play. Um, and it completely changed the messages down to the employees of what their importance are, what the company was all about, what their long-term goal was. This company is a very old, long-lived company, and, and it, it changed. So, there's, so we have sort of a bunch of these case studies. Um, it's very hard to nail that down because a lot of it is anecdotal, but that's the flavor of what we're getting at in terms of mechanism. Um, I can keep on yammering. Elu, is there a question or a comment that you want to... Uh, <laughs> interject here or because Caroline gave me so much food for thought that I can that I can easily take up the rest of the time. Just uh, you're, uh, that's fair enough. Um, uh, Caroline, do you want to briefly respond to, to, to one of these thoughts? Please. Yes, I, I, I do think even if it's just case studies, correct, qualitative evidence would be this would enrich and enrich our understanding yeah. a lot. Yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Okay, so um, let me let me turn to one or two uh, questions that I have received and to try to address them um, to, to to put them to you in real time. Um, one question that came up earlier during your talk, and I think there is something to that. Um, bringing in two different ideas, I try to combine two questions into questions into one. Um, one is where does shared value fall in the corporate governance debate. Um, shared value, I guess you opened several cans here of not of warmth, but of, of good, good stuff. But so where, where between these cans does the notion of a shared value fall? That is one question. And uh, since I'm at it, let me just um, put the second question right next to it. Um, there is uh, somebody clearly more from the practical side, we are just now implementing the meaningful KPI system in order to increase engagement in corporate performance. Um, I guess um, this is uh, not just a statement, uh, but it's also a question which I would like to put to you, maybe to both of you. Um, what is a meaningful KPI system in your view? Um, I mean, assuming that the one uh, that the that the person who asked that question doesn't have the answer, um, maybe you can say something about that issue. So these are the two questions I would first want to put to you. Great, thank you. So can I can I take a first crack, Caroline? Uh, I think you should you should try, Claudine. Please. Okay, great. So I'll grab the floor. Um, so on on the shared on the shared value side, right now we're fairly agnostic, and and that goes directly to also Caroline's point, and in fact. What she sort of meant as a critique, I've often featured as a benefit of our approach, which is, which is as a researcher, you know, I, I'm very hesitant of sort of this line between academic research and advocacy. And so what might be pro-social to me might not be pro-social to you. And so people that work, for instance, for Smith & Wesson as a arms man, you, you know, like what in, in, in America, they might feel I'm defending freedom. I'm defending, you know, the right to bear arms. I'm defending the Second Amendment. That might not feel very pro-social to me, um, but I'm hesitant to, 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 you know, place my values on that. And so in that sense, our work actually deliberately uh, uh, um, abstracts away from that. If the employees are feeling meaning in their work, then that's purpose. Um, I might disagree with that purpose, and but then we can have a social debate of how we aggregate up social preferences, um, which is different. Um, 
So, so in that sense, it's a little, it's, it's somewhat agnostic, but, but specifically there is one result that's less agnostic and that is this relationship between CEO pay and salary pay. So this pay gap within firms and purpose. And so there is a very strong result that the more the CEO is paid relative to, and again, this is the most common salaried role. So this is not getting into this mix shift of hourly workers versus salary workers. This is, you know, you have a salary professional role, you have the CEO, what's the median gap? And that is correlated with this, with this, with this purpose gap within firms. And so there is a sense, uh, to the extent that we can contribute to this, is that um, you know you can't be viewed as a vampire CEO. Um, you know, uh, so that's so that's one piece of it. On the meaningful KPIs, um, so this is. You know, I'm going to flip it around on you and say, you know, as a as a as an empirical researcher, we want more data. So part of you know the weakness of our study that Caroline pointed out is. We're measuring aggregate meaningfulness as purpose, and that's great and, and helpful, but it's sort of a response to the data desert that we're in, which is that this is our way of getting around the fact that we don't have great measures of, of purpose. Um, so uh, the more data that is produced and publicly available, the better off we are. Um, I will say that our data is predictive of, of a lot of different things. So to the extent that you can measure aggregate meaningfulness across your firm, and what we've done, and you have to read the papers to get the details on this, we've stripped out employee engagement from this. So we've, we've, what's, we've, we've done what's called, it's a little bit fancy statistics, but we've done what's called uh, an exploratory factor analysis, and we've orthogonalized the vectors that fall out of this survey. So what that means in short, uh, in lay terms, is that overall happiness is stripped out of our analysis. So this is controlling for the overall engagement of your employees, how much of that engagement comes from this sense of meaningfulness versus other aspects. That's what we're studying. So to the extent within your firms that you're not just measuring engagement, you're not just measuring happiness, but you're actually measuring this sense of meaningfulness of the way that you and your job are contributing to you know, society or to whatever the stated mission of the company is, that I think is meaningful and it's going to be different firm by firm. Um, and that's the challenge of the data from our side in doing these aggregate uh, studies. Yes, thank you. Um, Carolyn, uh, can I invite you to uh, address this, uh, this topic as well, briefly? Thank you, sure. So I, I totally agree with Claudine. I think the authors really elegantly circumvented this question about, you know, shared value versus corporate purpose versus whatever. This is really very fluffy and very hard to measure. And what the beauty of these studies is they have real data about employees' work meaningfulness. Um, in terms of KPIs, um, what, what are meaningful KPIs? That's a good question. Um, I would like to push our thinking a little bit further, you know, of what can we measure, but also what makes sense in terms of longer term, maybe linking it to what Paul Polman mentioned before, how can we engage anyone, not just managers, but also employees into longer term thinking and more sustainable business practices, and potentially, for example, link executive compensation to social and environmental performance criteria and longer term performance outcomes. And so when you think about your KPIs, you may also want to make sure that it's not just short term KPIs, but rather KPIs um, that capture these longer term values. Thank you. Um, I hope there was enough as, an, as a response to this unposed question by uh, the uh, uh, participant. Let me turn to another issue that was raised, namely the question of relational contracts, if I may. Um, of course, an interesting concept, quite, quite old, quite old. And I'm sure that uh, in your, uh, in your uh, variety of concepts that you would have to go through and that you would have to classify, it shows up somewhere. Claudine, where does it show up? <laughs> it shows up in the very end of the discussion section. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for those of you that are not familiar with this term, relational contract is essentially in economic terms, it's sort of a repeated game type of contract. So it's basically saying, um, you know, let's get away from sort of the second best of typical contract economics to something where we can get to sort of first best outcomes because, you know, we're, we're 
going to cooperate from now to infinity. So it's in my interest to help you. It's your interest to help me. And we can build these relational contracts. And, um, and so, you know, so, so how do we think about this, this work? And so the logical way of thinking about this work is relates to that a is those are really hard to study, um, <laughs> but uh, so you can think about purpose as um, so the way we discuss it is is we can think about purpose as enabling relational contracts, particularly in the middle ranks. So when you think about what you know the, our middle rank result, which is that you have to have high purpose among your middle managers in order to relate to performance, you can think about that's the ranks of your organizations where your contracting problems are the greatest because you can put executive compensation packages into play that are directly linked to stock returns and to other corporate metrics. You can put hourly uh, contracts into play that are directly linked to piece rates or hours worked or whatever metrics you have. It's your professional ranks where you have the largest contracting problems in the firm. And those are also arguably where a lot of the intangible value comes from. And so what we discuss in this paper is purpose is sort of a solution to that contracting problem inside of firms. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an interesting thing. I mean, I've been thinking about uh, relational contracts for, for many years and never really figured out what it was. And uh, I think your paper would make me go back to that issue and think about it again, because you have something to say about that. That's interesting. <laughs> um, I have no more uh, question right now from the audience. So that gives me the privilege to ask a question of my own. And um, in a sense, I would like to link up to um, Carolyn's uh, initial uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat, uh, uh, let's say, provocative question on: uh, Is it uh, is it purpose to to to, to build the most deadly weapons? And uh, question is: How do you separate the good from the bad? How do you separate value judgments from feelings, etc.? Let me make this very much uh, try to make that precise in a certain sense. You may have uh, seen or heard that in the last. Uh, a uh, few months, one of the most uh, applauded and famous and fashionable and uh, and uh, liked companies in Germany collapsed uh, in a very ugly way called Wirecard. It's a firm for digital digital payment services that was uh, storming the uh, corporate uh, ladder and uh, becoming one of the most celebrated firms in Germany. Uh, a lot of positive. Uh, a lot of positive publicity, a lot of, uh, they, 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 they went into the German DAX, so the top 30 German publicly listed firms um, with, uh, with high praise. People loved to work there. And they, couldn't, uh, they, couldn't even, uh, um, they, they couldn't even stop people from applying directly corporate atmosphere, corporate culture, all this loomed high in the public perception. This firm seems to have been a complete fraud, basically um, a business concept that was built on fraud and deception and accounting misstatements. I haven't really investigated that. I've only read about this in the public press. But uh, I mean, what is, what would your spontaneous answer be um, there seemed to have been a lot of purpose along some of the dimensions that you have um, that you have uh, mentioned, uh, along the lines of uh, identification with management goals, along the lines of employee satisfaction, etc. This firm is a complete fraud. So, what distinguishes the right corporate purpose from the wrong corporate purpose? I mean, what what do you, Claudine? What do you think according to your empirical research, you would tell those people who have uh, seen Wirecard collapse and been forced into unemployment? I think, I mean, look, I think this is probably the key question or one of the key questions of this whole conference, right? Which is how do we decide what purpose actually is? And, you know, nothing in our empirical research sort of answers that. So this is purely my own sort of interpretation. But again, I think that you know, what is the best of the worst systems? You know, do we impose sort of a centrally decided corporate purpose or do we allow, you know, a sort of purpose to emerge as the aggregate of social preferences with enough information disclosed that people can decide? And, you know, I think that that's a real, that is a real question. I'll give a very quick example because I know we're running low on time, but um, 
in my MBA class, we talk about sort of Google, you know, the, like the tech walkouts that happened in Silicon Valley last year over collaboration with um, government on defense work, right? So the employees basically made a decision that they wanted to exert their voice and forced Google, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, I think to some degree, Microsoft as well, to withdraw from some of their defense work on facial recognition, particularly border control. Um, and another company picked it up. And both of them are purpose-driven companies. Uh, and so, uh, so the tech companies have one set of purpose, you know, sort of facilitating voice and democratizing voice. And the company that picked it up is a company called Palantir. I actually had their chief of staff come talk to my MBAs. And they have a very different purpose around enabling sort of a defense of the country. Um, and so that to me is a very good example of um, sort of, you know, different companies aggregate different social preferences. Uh, but, you know, information disclosure uh, and, you know, allowing voice, I think, are two very important mechanisms for allowing that to happen. Or the alternative is some central, you know, arbiter of what social purpose is. And that, that to me, makes me a little bit uncomfortable. I think you're muted. Of course, it didn't work. My, my mouse didn't work for me. So that even makes the best intentions uh, avoid. <laughs> if mouse sound works, the small ones. So a remarkable answer, I was saying. Thank you very much. I um, have to think about this. And you have really, I think this is why I opened this up with this uh, sort of provocative statement by Carla. No, that academics may be still behind and they don't like to adapt to the new challenges of their paradigms. I think you have done that. And uh, it was a great pleasure to share this session. And uh, I'm drawing this session now to a close. And uh, thank both of you, Caroline and Claudine. Thanks a lot. Uh, was very uh, interesting, and I think uh, it links very nicely back to what we heard in the discussions by Bengt and Paul before in various ways. And I don't want to make those connections here. That's beyond my beyond my job. I'm turning it over back to Marco. Thanks. Here you go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.